Listen up, listen. And you too, sister. Let's talk about something that's a real brain booster. Drugs, drugs, drugs. We got good, we got bad. Drugs, drugs, drugs. Ask your mom or ask your dad. And drug abuse is not a so-called victimless My brother was not a criminal until the system made him one. Every single day you might tell yourself, today is the day I'm going to quit, today is the day I'm going to quit, today is the day I'm going to quit. Doctors are being held accountable for prescribing painkillers to people that actually need them. They asked us to move out and we actually got sober at one point, fell back into it, wasn't ready to quit, so to speak. It's like having an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting above a bar. It's like a cycle. It's just a vicious cycle. You try and hide it the best you can, but... Winners don't do drugs! My high school years, definitely uh, drank a lot with my friends, smoked weed every day before class, normal 16, 17 year old stuff, and just kind of led from there into the harder stuff. <laughs> Everybody seemed to be into it when I was younger, just started kind of taking the pills and stuff like that as everybody else, and then uh, a friend of ours said, oh, well, we can get, you know, heroin which is cheaper and you get more like for your money and as apprehensive as I was when you're that far into it I said oh, okay so that led me down that path <laughs> so I've been a Portland police officer for 26 years as a new officer um, back in the 1990s I worked in Old Town so the Old Town area, which is also known in Portland as Chinatown. My partner and I worked night shift, and we did what I would refer to as low-level drug arrests, a lot of crack cocaine and heroin back in the 1990s. Well, after I was the street crime sergeant at Central Precinct, in 2011, I went to the Drugs and Vice Division. And in the Drugs and Vice Division, they're doing more of a high level, not so much of the users and the lower amounts of drug dealers, but the higher amounts. We're looking at kilo level dealers in the city of Portland and focusing mainly at that point on heroin and methamphetamine. Well, my brother was my brother. It's a very interesting guy. Huge sense of humor, big personality. Uh, I think I got a lot of my sense of humor from him, especially my enjoyment of humor that makes people uncomfortable. To my family, he was he was the same. He was, you know, a big personality. Um, he was a musician. He was a bass player, played guitar. It started when he was about 14 or 15 years old when he had open heart surgery. And he was prescribed Oxycontin for the pain after the surgery, and that led him into a state of addiction. So, a lot of the heroin addicts that we dealt with on a day to day basis started off by using Oxy. Um, and a lot of times, as a result of some kind of serious physical injury that had occurred in their lives, they had gone to Oxy, they got addicted to the Oxy, and they couldn't afford. Oxy anymore because at that time it was about one to two dollars a milligram. An Oxy 80, which was 80 milligrams, would go anywhere from around $80 to $160 a pill. You could get the same shot of heroin for about 10 to 20 dollars. The problem was is the heroin, how pure is it? As an example, you might have a dealer that you've been buying heroin from 
for a months that dealer's heroin was 20 percent pure so you got used to using that amount your body accepted that amount of heroin every single day well for some reason that dealer you couldn't get heroin from them anymore so you went to a new dealer that new dealer's heroin was 80 percent pure you use the same amount not knowing the purity because you don't know the purity of the heroin and how it's cut. Instead of using a 10% pure amount of heroin, you just use the 90%, it's nine times stronger, and you overdose, and it kills you. Unlike a pill that's very regulated, you know how much oxy is in the pill, the heroin is completely unregulated, and you don't know the percentage when you're getting it from a new person. Yes, I was fortunate enough to be like what I called a functioning addict. So I definitely used and abused my drugs. However, I withheld a job the whole time. I continued to work and see my family and stuff like that. But I definitely couldn't not have it. So I would not be the person I am today without the addiction that I had. Now, in saying that... I work in the retail industry where a lot of people like that tend to come in and do things that maybe somebody who wasn't familiar with that wouldn't notice them doing. So I get to like, you know, stop the theft and maybe stop a drug transaction in my neighborhood or make somebody like that feel uncomfortable to ease them on their way or anything like that. My mother was the primary caretaker for him you know she had a she had a mixed reaction you know he he should have been getting this treatment from the doctors presumably so she was kind of caught in this place where her son had real medical issues but the world was telling her he's an addict he's a junkie basically people who knew less about the condition you just see you just see a drug addict but really it's just someone that needed medical treatment and so, you know, society labeled him a drug addict because he had drug-seeking behavior. One of our uh, confidential informants who actually helped us out on the street had been a star football player in high school. They were a quarterback, were considered a potential to go scholarship ride to college and possibly go to the NFL. This person um, had a serious injury during a football game. Uh, it was a broken collarbone. The doctors prescribed this person oxy. This person had a very addictive personality and got hooked on the oxy. Um, came from a very wealthy family. But because of that injury and because of the oxy that they were prescribed, that addictive chemistry led them to being addicted to oxy, being cut off from all their family because of uh, stealing from their family all the way to becoming a heroin addict because it's much cheaper than getting oxy and becoming a homeless person on the streets of Portland, living in a tent under a bridge. My parents knew I was living with them at the time. Um, my dad actually took opioids as a medication and I would steal them from him. And so when they found that out, they asked us to move out. And so we did and we actually got sober at one point and um, was living all on, on our own and stuff like that. Fell back into it. We moved in with his parents, and then we started taking jewelry, hawking it for money, and they found out that way. And um, my husband's mom is actually the one that found out about the methadone clinic to get us into it. Most of these people that get addicted don't get addicted from crack and then move on to, to heroin. Most of the people caught up in the op opioid epidemic are People who had legitimate pain issues, you know, you break a leg, you have surgery, something else. Or like my brother, um, you have a, a long-term genetic condition that's going to make you require treatment for your pain. And right now we just don't have the things in place to get people off. And once people do get addicted, they're treated like criminals rather than, you know, people who have you know, an actual problem. They'll always be a problem. They'll always be, you know, them prescribed to people. Maybe somebody who hasn't, you know, 
ever been a drug addict for that matter, but gets addicted to it and leads them into it. However, there are solutions out there for those people and those people just need to know the right solution. I went to a methadone clinic. So because I was a functioning addict, I couldn't afford to lose my job. So I couldn't afford to take the time off that one would need to work through withdrawals or go to an inpatient treatment center or anything like that. Now a methadone clinic is virtually an outpatient program. So you go in every day, you get a medicine that you take every day that you have to take there, you don't get to leave with it, which is also good because you can't go out and take that medication, sell it. So for a while I went there every day, I got my methadone, I got the counseling and the groups that I needed to get better. There are solutions out there, you just need to know the ones to do. Could they advocate more for what the solutions are? Yes, but if you really want to get sober, you'll get sober. I can count on one hand a couple of people, maybe three, that um, were successful. A lot of people relapsed. They just couldn't do it. But I, off the top of my head, I can think of just two or three people that I think successfully beat it and moved on with their lives. From their addictions if you're not ready to get sober you're not ready to get sober it's unfortunate but true <laughs> okay so i got fortunate enough that by taking that route of methadone clinic i didn't have to physically deal with the physical aspect but to somebody who may not know the resources or anything like that um the, that physical illness that you have uh is pretty much unbearable. Well, okay, so I definitely took my time longer than I needed. I was young when I went into the methadone clinic. I was 19. Another bad thing about methadone clinics is they really didn't monitor correctly. So they allowed me to go up to 120 milligrams of methadone when in reality I could have been just fine at 30 milligrams. So the addict that I was, I definitely took that as an advantage to me and for many a years was on methadone for the wrong reason. I mean, I was in that methadone clinic for 10 years, which was probably eight years too long. So I had decided, you know, two years prior to me getting off that I was ready to get off. And you just kind of slowly wean yourself down and work yourself out. I don't have an answer on how to fix it because we'll, we'll never stop drugs flowing into this country. I think you can mitigate it. What I'm talking about is stopping the amount of drugs flowing into the country. Treatment for people who are addicted and need help and are willing to get that help by reducing the amount of drugs coming into the country. That if today's the day that you can't get your heroin because it's been cut back on the front end the supply has been cut off. Today's maybe the day that you decide you need to go to treatment. We're kind of coming to the other end of this problem where at first we were over prescribing um, and not giving people the help they need to get back off of them. Uh, and now we're having almost the opposite problem where people that need pain treatment are not being given it because the doctors are too afraid of the, the blowback of people getting addicted. Doctors are being held accountable for prescribing pain, uh, painkillers to people that actually need them. I mean, for anybody who is struggling, I definitely want them to know that it's okay to talk about it. There are resources out there. Don't be afraid to ask about it. Don't be afraid to Google it. You, you don't even have to talk to anybody about it if you don't want to. There are plenty of resources out there. And I'm not going to say that they're cheap resources. I paid $300 a month, 600 including my husband, to get better for however long it took to, you know, be, be on, you know. I mean, I had people living with me that shouldn't have been living with me. <laughs> I had, you know, drug deals going on out of my apartment that could have led me down a wrong path. I've been pulled over with lots of drugs in my car and never got caught. I mean, I was definitely super fortunate. You know, and I never had to go to jail. I never got ticketed. I, I mean, I really never got in trouble for it. 
I mean, my rock bottom was not most, you know, my rock bottom was I can't go to work. I got to get better. You know, I never lost my home. I never lost friends. I never lost my car. And I mean, everybody rock, everybody's rock bottom's different. You know, sometimes it takes losing everything. And I'm fortunate that my husband's mom, you know, picked us up and said, listen, this is how we can get better. If he would have gotten adequate treatment, if he would have gotten support, addiction support, he had, he had real pain that needed to be treated. And instead of giving him that treatment, instead of giving him that support, instead of, instead of putting him in rehabilitation, which was prohibitively expensive at the time, they just charge us 700 bucks a month for a, a drug that we could barely afford, which didn't, didn't fix them. Das hört mir.